It's your favorite time of week, Wednesday. This is the fun facts and strange claims about ancient Greece iceberg chart, and this is what we're diving right on into this week. So buckle your fuckles, get cozy, and try to find my biological father because he's still missing. Now I'm gonna keep it 100 with you. We're just gonna go ahead and skip through the first two levels of this iceberg. Because I'm here for the interesting stuff, and just about everyone knows everything that's on these top two levels, so I really don't need to explain it to you. But I will give you a、uh, quick bit on these two right here. Eratosthenes, I think that's how you pronounce it, discovered the Earth is round and calculated its circumference. Many societies did this. When you don't have this thing called "we'll kill you if you don't like Jesus Christ" running around. Well,、uh, science does really well. Aristarchus developed the heliocentric helio model of our solar system. Again, many people discovered this. When you don't have, we'll kill you if you don't like Jesus Christ running around. Science goes far. So, without further ado, let's just buckle our fuckles and get on to the new level one. Greek colonies stretching from Spain to Russia. This one is true. As societies get bigger, as there's more people and more mouths to feed, humanity expands. It goes further, and it keeps going further until it gobbles up all of the land. The Greeks never really got this far. Of course, there's many flavors of Greek: Dacians, Thracians, Illyrians, Etruscans, even Phoenicians. However, all of them expanded to some extent before their societies fell. Greek fire. Greek fire was basically a pre-20th century napalm. It was a closely guarded state secret by the Byzantine Empire. The recipe was not allowed to leak, but that shit burnt everywhere. It burnt in water. It burnt underwater. And most importantly, it burnt the fuck out of boats, which is how the Byzantine navy was so successful. Because、uh, you know, a lot of boats don't really have preventative measures. At least not in those days, because fires don't really bug you. You're in the middle of the fucking ocean. But when water doesn't put out flames, well, whoop de doop de do. Guess your naval battle just got cut. That's why Greek fire was such a closely held secret. So close, as a matter of fact, that we can't really recreate the recipe, and we don't know what it was exactly, leading to the napalm comparisons and theories. Greek statues were painted. Yes, this one may come as a bit of a shock. Most statues we have from that era that are recoverable don't have the paint on them anymore. But Greek statues were painted. They were painted mostly because what is the point of staring at a block of marble? And also, the statues of people don't really look like people if there's no paint on them. So there's your fun tidbit of history for the day. Prepare for about. A hundred more fun tidbits. F Y R O M identity crisis. The former Yugoslavic Republic of Macedonia experienced a bit of a naming problem when they wanted to rename the country to something less fucking clunky. A very wise move. They wanted to rename themselves as simply Macedonia, but Greek was like, "Hey, where Macedonia?" Now, obviously, Greece was not rocking with this. Northern Macedonia, what the country is called now, was not rocking with this. And for 25 years, we had problems over this, over the fucking name. And、uh, yeah, it was finally resolved, and the nation now goes by North Macedonia because Greece is technically South Macedonia, I guess. It takes up most of the Macedonian geological region. So I suppose just naming North Macedonia Macedonia wouldn't have worked, but I don't see why there needed to be a fucking tizzy tantrum over it. Kalash people are the descendants of Alexander the Great's army. This entry alleges that the Kalash ethnic group are in fact descendants of Alexander the Great's army, who was in the same area they were in、uh, about 300 years before Jesus Christ died. Now, of course. This is well, not exactly proven, but not entirely unlikely. The Kalash people live in Pakistan, but have fair skin, 
blue eyes and green eyes very commonly. It's entirely possible that when an army settled in the area, they did what armies do, which is have a lot of sex, creating the Kalash ethnic group. Unfortunately, the Kalash are in danger of their culture dying out, mostly because there's only about 4,000 of them left. Well, we did it, and now we're on to level 2 of this iceberg. There's only been fun facts about Bree so far, but trust me, the trolling begins soon. So let's just dive right on in. Pythias reached England. Pythias of Massalia was an explorer from Massalia, Greece, who went all the way to England in the 4th century. This isn't entirely remarkable except for the fact that the people of the Mediterranean Greek cultures saw England in places north as somewhere so far north that the god of cold wouldn't even visit. So for Pythias to simply do it because he wanted to was seen as absolutely nutty for the time. Pythias reached England. Pythias of Massalia was an explorer from Massalia, Greece, who went all the way to England in the 4th century. This isn't entirely remarkable except for the fact that the people of the Mediterranean Greek cultures saw England in places north as somewhere so far north that the god of cold wouldn't even visit. So for Pythias to simply do it because he wanted to was seen as absolutely nutty for the time. To top his feet off, he got there using math, math so nutty that it immediately gave him his virginity back. That's how determined this guy was, and then once he was done touring around Britain and Scotland, he decided, you know what, I want to go further fucking north, and did, landing in a place that he called Thule. Now we don't know for sure whether or not Thule was the shores of Norway, or if it was Iceland, but the fact remains that this guy went an absurd distance from someone from fucking Greece. Falmeyer's Theory This theory is a question of genetics in the Peloponnese area, which used to be dominated by Hellenic tribes, which is Greek people, and successfully withstood not only the Byzantine Empire trying to crush them, but also barbarian attacks until eventually they didn't. Well, Falmeyer's theory suggests that rather than the culture simply dying out, the barbarians overwhelmed them. Whether or not this theory is true, well, we can't really know for sure, but what we do know is before this, no barbarian in Peloponnesian area, after this, now barbarian in Peloponnesian area. So whether it was a societal collapse for the Hellenic tribes within that area, or if the barbarians simply won, we won't know for sure, but it could be either one. Zeno's Paradoxes Zeno's Paradoxes was a set of paradoxes set to primarily defend Paramendi's philosophical ideals. Most notable among these paradoxes is the Motion Paradox, which states that motion is simply a myth. Yes, you heard that right. The reasoning behind this paradox is that in order to get somewhere, you obviously have to get halfway first, and then you have to be a quarter of the way, and then you have to be an eighth of the way, and then you have to be a sixteenth of the way, and then a thirty-second, and then a sixty-fourth. Basically, you will always almost be there, but never actually get there. However, this is not only known as complete and utter bullshit now, but was then when Diogenes the Cynic, upon hearing this, simply stood up and walked away. Ship of Theseus this is now the third video in which I have talked about the ship of Theseus, but let's have at it again, third time's the charm. Theseus was a hero from Greek lore and legend that sailed the seas in his boat, but his boat gets a little bit damaged. First it's just some planks rotting, so he replaces them. Then the mast breaks, so he replaces it, and then the sail rips, so he replaces it. Until eventually, after a few years, he's replaced everything on the boat. Is it still the same ship that sailed when Theseus first left, or is it a different ship? This question has been used to create thought experiments in which we even question if we're still the same selves. 
whether it's biologically because of the fact that every eight years your cells have all completely changed and regenerated, or if it's because of the fact that mentally you change a little bit every day until the you one year from now is unrecognizable from the you that you are today. Allegory of the Cave Suppose that four prisoners, or maybe some other number, are chained to a wall in a cave, watching shadows created by a fire. This is all they have ever known, all that by all rights they should ever know. This is reality to them. Now suppose for a second that we free one of these prisoners, that we show them the fire that creates their reality. At first they would turn away from the fire, right? turn back to what was real, try and base themselves in what they knew, but eventually they'd move on. Take it a step further, free that prisoner from the cave, show them reality. Eventually, when they were returned to the cave, they would try and get all the other prisoners to go with them to experience the real, real world. But would the other prisoners listen? This thought experiment is meant to determine the condition of humanity. It's in our nature to base our reality, our present and our future, off of our past, off of what we know beforehand. There's a reason George Orwell said, he who controls the past controls the future. Precedent is a massive basis for our decision-making skills. So if you set this prisoner free, would they simply turn around? Would they turn back to what was nice? Better yet, if we're all in a cave and one of you was let out, would you be able to try and bring us all up to the surface with you? Or would you simply ignore it and pretend that it wasn't real? That's the purpose of the cave allegory, to make you think about things like that. Agoje. Agoje was the state-sponsored training program that every Spartan boy went through from ages 7 to 29. It was divided into three groups based off of age, and it was meant to inspire and create a society full of warrior men who were witty, strong, and most of all, loyal to Sparta. This program is generally credited with creating some of the best soldiers in antiquity, as the Spartans were a force to be reckoned with. The Greeks invented the first computer. Calling Major Cap on this, the Greeks didn't have Minecraft, nor did they have a need to jack off to hentai, so there was simply no point for computers to exist. Now looking at it through the historical lens, the first analog computer ever was actually invented by the Chinese about 200 years before the device we're about to discuss, the Antikythera device. The Antikythera device is a computer supposedly invented by Archimedes, but it doesn't work in the manner that you would think a computer works. No, not in the slightest. The Antikythera device was a computer that would calculate astrological dates in the future and would display them. It was very interesting and also one of the only things ever plundered from Archimedes' place of study after he was killed by Romans. Here we are now to level 3. Let the trolling begin. But before that happens, if you're new here and you've made it this far into the video, I'd like it to take a second to just thank you. It really means a lot that I can make these videos and have an audience, so I really appreciate you watching this far. Now that's enough of me being sentimental. Back to trolling. Pythias reached Scandinavia. Yeah, remember that fool place that he discovered? Well, we really don't know where it fucking was. So what's likely is that after visiting Shetland and leaving Britain for seven days to sail even further north, he either stumbled upon Iceland or the shores of Norway. Mycenaean Heavy Plate Armor in a local warlord's tomb in the 1960s in the Peloponnesian era of Greece, a groundbreaking discovery was made. This groundbreaking discovery? An outfit. But not just any outfit, a metal one. Heavy bronze plate armor. 
Now, normally this wouldn't be very remarkable, except for the fact that this was made 1,500 years ago. Before the death of Christ, that is, so technically almost 4,000 years ago. It demonstrates an incredible amount of technical knowledge that most blacksmiths didn't even have for millennia afterwards, literally. As a matter of fact, plate mail itself didn't really come into use until the 15th to 16th centuries, and was even then rapidly outclassed by a little thing called fucking guns. So the fact that we could make this shit 1,500 years, 1,500 BCE, before the death of Christ, is wildly impressive. Drachma was used between 6th century BCE to 2002. Now, the Greek drachma was in fact used from 6th century BCE when it was first starting to see widespread use in city-states until 2002. Why? Because if it's not broke, why fix it, I guess. It's absolutely nutty that these coins were legal tender long enough for, you know, them to erode to nothing, to rust away and there was no changes made. However, there was slight adjustments to the manufacturing and minting, and even notes made so that way drachma weren't just, you know, centuries old coins that you were throwing at someone. God have mercy on how many diseases those things might have had. However, when the euro took over as European currency, no more drachma. The Greeks invented the first robot. I'll be honest with you, I thought this one was entirely bullshit. But it turns out that, surprisingly, an automatic maid was made by Phylon of Byzantium in the 3rd century before Christ. Now, this is absolutely insane, but it doesn't go around and clean your house and jack your cock off for you. It simply dilutes wine with water and then stores it in a jug in her chest. Still, it's absolutely insane that someone put this shit together with fucking gears and it's insane that they even had the time to do that, but when you get zero sex, have no kids, and got nothing else better to do with your time because the internet doesn't exist, I guess you would also make a water wine dilution robot as well. Still completely bizarre that someone in the 3rd century thought of that shit, but alright, I respect the grind. Alchemy Alchemy in history, not the cool kind of alchemy in Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, was the pointless pursuit of trying to purify materials and turn that shit into gold and other stuff that would keep you rich and young forever. However, it didn't work out so well. But because of the fact that ancient Greeks were literally the first to fucking everything, there is, of course, Greek alchemists, one of whom Cleopatra could even supposedly produce and procure the Philosopher's Stone. Well, now here we are, level 4, already almost halfway through the video. I hope you're enjoying yourself, and I hope you're prepared. Let's just dive right on in. Pythias reached Iceland. Everyone knows by now Pythias sailed north, and he thought Britain was a very cool place. As a matter of fact, he even brought the word Britannic back from Britain with him. Then, after he was done with Britain, he decided, hey, you know what, before I go home, I think I want to go even further beyond. So, instead of going Super Saiyan 2, Homeboy sailed north for a full week after leaving Britain, before finally turning around. He landed in this place called Thule. I've rehashed this before. We don't really know where Thule is. We don't know what it was. It's most likely that it was either an island or the shores of Scandinavia, but it is possible that he reached Iceland because of the fact we don't fucking know. We can't really prove it, but we can't really disprove it either, so it remains in the conversation. Minoans had indoor plumbing. When I say the Greeks were the first to fucking everything, I meant it. They were the first to everything, including flushable toilets. As a matter of fact, the Minoan indoor plumbing worked in much the same way that 50s British indoor plumbing did, which is a great achievement on behalf of the Minoans and a great disappointment on behalf of the British. 
But I digress. It worked by having a reserve of water above the toilet that you then flushed, and then, you know, it was flushed. Not only is this insane, but the fact that we discovered it thousands of years later and we're like, hey, holy fucking shit, bro, this is a toilet, is absolutely nutty. The fact that we could recognize it is crazy to me. Also, peep this highway in Wyoming. I already know Wyoming doesn't exist, and if you believe that too, it's time to wake the fuck up. But there's two cars on this road. That's insane. That's half the population of Wyoming right there. The Greeks invented the first shower. If this was on your, the Greeks invented this first bingo card, go ahead and check it off and win your $25 McDonald's gift card. Because this is yet another thing the Greeks invented first. With plumbing and running water to their cities, it wasn't very hard to set up public showering spaces that they went ahead and used. Alexander the Great had heterochromia. Heterochromia is when one eye or a portion of one eye is a different color than what majority of your eyeballs are colored. And it's believed that Alexander the Great, the Chad himself, had one blue eye and one brown eye, mostly because by most accounts, that is how he was described. Mind Palace of Simonides, otherwise known as the Method of Iochi. This is a mnemonic method, wow, that's a tongue twister, used to memorize things in a particular manner based off of the environment you're in. This is used by every arrogant prick genius ever in fiction, and also by plenty of people. If you can remember finite details about where you were, you will remember finite details about what is happening. So when you want to remember something, simply remember the small things about where you are, and when you think of that space, what was discussed will also come to mind. Hyperborea The Greeks were a Mediterranean people, so understandably the idea of cold had them shitting their pants on the spot. There was, of course, a god of cold, Boreas, and this is where Aurora Borealis gets its name, because it's Far North Lights. However, however, because of the fact that they were a Mediterranean culture, their idea of literally too cold to exist was like the middle of Europe. So there was places beyond where the god of the north supposedly resided. The Hyperborea were the people in places so far north that not even the god of the north would even fuck around with that. Which is why I am in a national park in uh, Greenland, because this is the furthest north location I could find on Google Maps Street View. Well, on to level 5. Isn't it sad how our time together is oh so short? Let's go ahead and finish this video up. Pythias reached America. Now there's a common misconception that Christopher Columbus was the first to reach America, which is wrong, Vikings did it beforehand, but also Christopher Columbus didn't even reach America. He sort of just accidentally landed up in the Caribbean, when by all rights he should have fucking starved to death in the ocean because his math was so goddamn wrong. But the original discoverer and namer of America was Amerigo Vespucci, an Italian explorer from, I believe, the 15th century. But do you know who showed him the way? Yes, that's right. Pythias showed Amerigo Vespucci how to get there. Pythias was here all along. Who do you think built those pyramids in Canada? Who do you think created the myth of Wyoming? That's right, it's always been Pythias. Pull out that fucking bingo card because the Greeks invented the first yo-yo. Yes, that's right. Well, they didn't invent the first one. That claim is actually major cap, but they did have the first known example discovered. So while the yo-yo was most likely invented somewhere in China, the Greeks were the only ones to have a yo-yo survive for two fucking millennia, so they're the ones accredited with it. I thought this was a shitpost, I thought it was a joke, I was prepared to make the haha -ha and the funny, and instead this was just a fact. What the fuck is this? This is not funny. Olympic Torch Relay Origin 
The Olympic torch relay is the art of bringing the Olympic flame from Olympia to wherever the games are going to be that year. And this one actually isn't rooted in any sort of historical precedent. Uh, it was actually thought of by Carl Diem in 1936. Why? I don't know, maybe he thought it was a cool idea. Brazen Bull Torture Device The Brazen Bull Torture Device is a torture method utilized in Athens and also a whole load of brazen bullshit. Basically, the brazen bull torture device was simply based around a bronze bull that could supposedly make bull noises that had a door on the side. Criminals would be thrown into this bitch, and then a fire would be lit underneath it. And then the criminal would burn alive. How exciting, I know. Except for the fact that there's no evidence that this existed, and it'd be incredibly hard to do with something like bronze and make it work. Nazis and the Honor. When Hitler rose to power, he thought it'd be neat to racially claim that Aryans made all of prehistory's major advancements, something that's complete bullshit, because if you still have your Greece did it first bingo card, you should see that Greece did literally everything first. So, the Nazi party created the Honor which was a super-secret select group of archaeologists, scientists, and anthropologists massive quotation marks on all of these meant to prove that the Aryans were actually the ones in Greece running everything. Because if you can't be racist, make science be racist. That's how it works, right? Socrates is fictional. Yes, just like Wyoming, the Queen of England, and Santa Claus, Socrates doesn't actually exist. He's complete and utter bullshit made up by Plato to supposit Plato's arguments. Just kidding, I think. The only reason we can really disprove this question of whether or not Socrates was even real was because of one Mr. Xenophon of Athens who wrote thanking Socrates and had had contact with him. Otherwise, this would be entirely possible. I mean, it still is possible. We all know Wyoming isn't real, so it's entirely possible Socrates isn't either. But it is very unlikely. Unlike the chance of you ever going to Wyoming. You ever bust a nut so hard that you fall asleep for four hours, and when you wake up it feels like it's super glue on your- Oh shit, sorry. Welcome to level six of the iceberg, the very last level where all of the super interesting stuff is going to be and you didn't hear me talking about anything else. Greek pregnancy test. Now the Greeks weren't the first to this because fucking and producing kids was pretty cool back then. It wasn't just introducing new sentience into agonizing life that would only know suffering and the slow death of everything around it. It was instead replacing the you that would very soon be dying like five years after you've made that little shit. But there was no way to tell if you were pregnant besides, oh fuck, I've missed my period and now I'm puking. Your body kind of tells you, but there was no way to be forewarned. There was, however, a fertility test that sounds absolutely agonizing. The fertility test involved robbing red rock dust in your eyelids, and then if it showed up in your spit, it meant that you were very fertile. Which meant that you were submissive and readable. Greece isn't a real nation. Come on, dude, you still believe in Greece? Seriously, my lady? For reals, my la envy? For extremity, my z, zer, however you use those pronouns? Come on. It's like Wyoming. It's like your friend's girlfriend in Canada that doesn't exist. It's like Cancun. It simply isn't real. And if you still believe in Greece, come on, man. This isn't fucking Tooth Fairy Eastermas anymore. Grow up. What the fuck? What the fuck is this? That is not funny. That is not- there's nothing- Japanese Ainu are actually Greek Ionians. This one is in fact complete and utter bullshit and here's why. The Japanese Ainu ethnic group carries a 16% allele rate of European facial features. This gives them a pseudo-Caucasian appearance, however, 
they are not. As a matter of fact, they're closely related to Eastern Asians and even Siberians. During the times that, you know, these people were migrating around because that's what ancient humans did, the Ainu Japanese and the people who fostered those people wound up in the Oak Tost area and even in Alaska. However, they are not specifically related to the Greeks in any manner. Which is kind of a bummer, I guess, because wouldn't that be fucking weird if they made it all the way to Japan? But no, they didn't. Helen and the original Greek tribes. In Greek mythology, there has to be a reason that some dude winds up in Greece, and that some dude is Helen, the son of Zeus and a nymph. Zeus is like, hey, my boy, go down to Earth. And then Helen just whippity whoppity pops up there and has three different sons. These three sons being Doris, Zeus, and Aeolus, which go on to father Tectimus, Aegemius, Achaeus, Ion, Magnus, and Magnus. And these sons all go on to father every single tribe and group of Greek people ever, because that's how Greek mythology works. That's how all mythology works. Genetic bottlenecking that would normally destroy a species. Well, 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 there it is, the very end of the video. Great job to you, incredible, truly. Thank you so much for watching this thing all the way through. It means a world to me that I get to make these silly videos and tell silly jokes and do it and have people watch. Now I'm going to be a whore for a little bit. If you made it this far into the video and you liked it, go ahead and just subscribe. It's completely free and it helps me pursue my dreams by getting me one number closer. I greatly appreciate it every time it happens. And, you know, it might just be nice to have you around here to see my future videos. Now, without further ado, that's me not being a whore anymore. Have a wonderful time. Again, thank you for watching. And, of course, memento mori.